Bill Quistorf here, Chief Pilot for Snohomish County Sheriff's Office here in Washington State. And I'm here to tell you about Snowhawk 10. This is our Bell UH-1H helicopter that's been significantly modified in 2004 and 2011. In 2011, we had the aircraft significantly modified, overhauled by Northwest Helicopters in Olympia. They took the aircraft, stripped it down to the sheet metal, removed every single component, fuel lines, hydraulic lines, electrical, uh, everything inside, and cleaned it up, inspected it all, and started putting it back together. So there, a lot of uh, modifications were done, especially in the cockpit and cabin areas. Here we are in the cockpit of Snowhawk 10, and there have been significant upgrades, modifications to this. Basically, this is a whole new instrument panel, console panel, uh, the seats, the aircraft controls. So everything in the cockpit and cabin has been built new by Northwest Helicopters in 2011. And we're very, very pleased with the setup and the instrumentation. Uh, the aircraft not only looks good, but it flies like a new helicopter. So we're, we're really pleased with it. Uh, some of the upgrades that we've had done, uh, we had the um, Garmin 500, uh, G500H added to um, the cockpit. It's a dual G500H, so we've got it on both uh, pilot and co-pilot sides. Um, we added the Garmin Duo 430s, uh, Wolfsburg. This is a dual band radio, so it's got both VHF for search and rescue and our 800 megahertz for uh, the sheriff's office, police, fire is on 800. So our, our cockpit has been modified by the military for NVG operations. Originally, the military was flying with NVGA night vision goggles. And so you see all the blue-green filters on everything, um, including the caution panel display has a blue-green filter. Uh, we've swapped over to NVGB model and so the, the B filters will allow us to view the colored images, the whites, the yellows, and they won't interfere with the goggles. So our displays have been modified with uh, MBG filters, and our goggles themselves have gone over to the MBGBs. One thing we recently added was our spider track system. Um, this keeps track of us. Anybody uh, who has access to the website that we give out uh, can track this aircraft uh, in flight real time. There's about a two minute delay, but uh, you can pull up Google Earth or any type of map system, satellite image, and you can actually watch us fly in real time on there. Uh, we've also had a um, uh, new load meter put on, a uh, new cargo hook installed and so we've we've got uh, a load meter attached to the cargo hook we can measure the amount of weight especially uh, when we're doing water bucket operations we can determine you know how much weight and how much water we're carrying in addition to that we've got the uh, fast the fast bucket system and that's automatically controlled here in the cockpit so uh, once it's all hooked up we just uh, dial this and this will increase or decrease the amount of water. We start with about 40% bucket capacity. The bucket is about 270 gallons full, so we start at about 40% of that. Um, and with our full weight of fuel, uh, plus the, the weight of the water in the bucket, um, that's probably our max to start out with. And then as we burn down fuel quantity, as the pounds of fuel burn down, I can just reach over here and dial this up and increase the water bucket capacity. So that's been really effective too. Uh, we have fire bucket, water bucket drop uh, control up front and the crew chief also has it in the back and we primarily uh, control that with the crew chief. We do not have a helicopter in either our first or second alarm brush assignments. So if you want a helicopter added to your incident, it's a resource you're gonna have to specifically request. Snowhawk 10 out of Snohomish County is typically our closest helicopter resource. Figure a 45 minute to one hour response time from the time of request. You'll need to provide the nearest dip site. We have a lot of lakes to choose from, with Lake Washington and Lake Sammamish being the most obvious choices. Once over the fire with a full bucket, careful communication and direction as to where you want the drop will be necessary. 
here's some of the finer points about how to request and direct a water drop. As a pilot's coming in, if he doesn't know your location, you definitely want to um, consider the aircraft as a clock, you know, with the nose being 12 and the tail of it being 6, and out the right door to the side will be uh, 3, and then out the left will be 9. And as you're coming in, you, you explain your position in relation to them. You know, I'm at your 12 o'clock low, or I'm at your, you know, 1 o'clock high, whatever it is, if it's coming in low or high. Go ahead. Yeah, at this time I'm going to use you for a spot drop. Um, I'm at your uh, 1 o'clock right now. 12 o'clock low. I got a panel set up. I have your panel. Yeah, if I could get a spot drop on this panel, that'd be great. Copy, spot on the panel. And you're all clear. Once they have you in position, um, then you can explain, you know, your position in relation to the parts of the fire, whether it be the heel or the left flank or right flank or the head of the fire. And um, I would ask people to refrain from using the cardinal directions, such as north, south, east, or west. Cardinal directions are really tough because, especially if I'm hanging out the window and I'm turning around, I'm looking for you. I'm not paying very much attention to which direction is south, which direction is west. Feedback is real important to the pilot. Good shot, 6-5, go ahead and uh, come on back. You need to, um, to communicate, you know, was the drop accurate? Was it too early? Was it late? And, and getting that, giving that honest feedback directly to the pilot. And they can also communicate to you your directions, you know, maybe your directions weren't very efficient or, or you know, lack some clarity. And, you know, clearing up that communication will make the second or third drop more efficient and reduce the exposure time. The consequences of a pilot not being able to contact a ground contact is it forces the pilot to burn circles in the air in, in trying to make contact with the ground person. Um, and if they, if they just can't, they're not gonna start doing um, any work on that fire until they can. It's a waste of time, it's inefficient, and flight time is expensive, um, and it's just putting everybody at a greater risk. The pilot's coming in before they've ever landed or set up for the bucket work. You say, I'm at the heel of the fire. Do you understand where that's at? Do you have the heel of the fire? And they'll say, yeah. And then do you have the head of the fire and the larger fires? It'll be pretty obvious, you know, where the, the area of the most intense heat is. And you say, all right, do you understand the left flank, right flank? This is how we got it going, set up. And, and then once you have that common ground established, that's the best part. And don't assume that the pilot knows exactly what you're seeing. Um, topography looks different, fire size looks different, people are hard to see and hard to locate. So really take into consideration and, and what it is you're explaining for the drop or the mission. As a ground firefighter, when you're working on a slope such as a 30% slope, to you it might appear moderately steep and a lot of times the directions are given as I want the next drop directly up slope of that. Um, from a pilot's perspective, the topography isn't as obvious. From his angle of flight, um, the 30% slope might look totally different to him and it might appear more flat and it's, it's more difficult for him to understand what upslope and downslope is. So it's helpful to be a little bit more specific on how it is you want the drop. The way we're going to improve safety is by limiting exposure. And how we limit exposure is by improving the efficiency of working with helicopters. And how do you improve efficiency is through better communications, both through verbal and visual, and giving good, honest feedback um, with the pilot.